Hi, everyone. So we have a few people here. Um, it is 1 p.m. We'll give about a minute more um, as you're logging on um, today. Um, go ahead and um, <laughs> get set up. I'm sure people are coming back from lunch. Um, it's around that time. So um, if you would, as you're logging on, please add your name, your school, and your district to the chat box. Um, and then if you would respond to the poll, um, Valerie, if you would launch that first poll for me, just um, tell me which one best describes your current role. Are you a district administrator, broadly speaking? Um, are you a school administrator, um, instructional staff, anyone who directly interfaces with students, or are you ISD staff? If you would just um, go ahead and fill that in, um, that will give us a sense of who we have with us today um, on, this, on this webinar. Oh, okay. Well, I think uh, some people may trickle on um, later, but this gives me a good sense of who we have today. Um, this is really helpful. Thank you so much for kind of letting us know. Um, uh, Valerie is going to share in the chat box um, the overview handouts. So those will be in the um, chat box for you, um, as well as a handout of the DBI steps um, in the DBI process. So feel free to download those now. Um, she'll post them again in about 10 minutes for any latecomers. Um, and if for some reason you're not able to get them, um, I'll share my contact information at the end um, and we'll make sure that we get you um, a copy of the handouts. I should say this is database individualization and overview um, uh, of the process for intensifying intervention. This is gonna be a pretty high flying 30,000 foot overview. So it's gonna be broad. Um, I'm not gonna go into some of the nitty gritty details. Um, those are for additional sessions. We could spend days on lots of the pieces of this, but this isn't that day. <laughs> this is a two hour webinar. Um, you guys have a lot going on. So I'm gonna stay a little bit high over the top today. Um, but if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Go ahead and whatever you need to do, raise your hand. Let me know if you need me to slow down. Um, I'll try to keep my eyes on it um, and keep a good view of it. But just let me know if there's something that I'm missing or you would like to. And I'll try to leave some time at the end as well for additional questions if those come up. All right. Um, I need to say right at the onset, I need to recognize a few things, a few people and a few groups. Um, first. What we're going to be talking about today, database individualization, is not something that I created or made up. Um, this has a long-standing tradition. It was first developed in 1977 in the 70s in uh, the University of Minnesota with Stan Dino and Phyllis Merkin. Um, at that time, they called it database program modification. You may have something else in your head when you hear those terms, database program modification. Um, but Stan Dino and Phyllis Merkin were really kind of the founders of this idea, as well as uh, kind of the founders of things like curriculum-based measures, fluency probes, um, even the idea of an individualized education plan really comes out of stuff that was happening federally and um, in Minnesota in the 70s. And lots and lots of things from MTSS to RTI come out of that. So I need to recognize them right on the top. I'm going to share a little bit of data later um, from Acadians Reading um, and it, as well as the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And some of this content has been developed in association with a partnership that we have with the National Center for Intensive Intervention um, from the American Institute for Research in, in Washington, DC. So we received some technical assistance from them as well. So I, I wanna make sure to reference them here. You guys have all been on a bazillion webinars at this point. You guys are Zoom pros. <laughs> um, we are all sick of Zooming. Um, so I know you guys are well aware of the regular expectations. But as I mentioned before, um, the, the main thing um, is that any, any questions you have, any comments, do feel free to put them in the chat box or do whatever you need to do. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm responding to what you guys are interested in and what you're wanting to hear about today. 
the purpose of this session is like I said, to offer a very brief inter, uh, overview of the purpose for and processes of database individualization and how those things fit within an MTSS framework. And I saw that a lot of you are either district personnel, ISD staff. Um, a lot of you mentioned that you are an MTSS coordinator and intervention coordinator. So for most of you, you're thinking of this through the lens of MTSS. You're doing a lot of work in this area. And so I want to kind of put DBI in the context of the work you're already doing in schools and with the students that you're working with, because I know many of you are doing exactly that right now. Um, I hope that through this session, um, you'll receive some guidance around how to identify those students who require intensive support, um, that you'll be able to define the five basic steps in the database and visualization DBI process, and then um, be able to demonstrate how DBI fits within an MTSS framework. Um, when you're thinking about planning and you're thinking about the students who you're working with and the teachers you're working with and the schools you're working with as well. So we'll start with the why of this. Why DBI for who and how do we know that? And then we'll talk about what DBI is, the broader definition and then the, the steps in the process. And then we'll get into how it fits into an MTSS framework. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we here at the Michigan MTSS Technical Assistance Center are hoping to come alongside you and support DBI implementation, as well as all the other parts of MTSS that you guys are currently working on implementing um, in your schools and in your districts right now. So let's jump in. Um, again, feel free to um, post questions in the chat as we jump into this, but why DBI? Who are we doing DBI for and how do we know that this is the right thing to do for those students? To get us started, here's a little thought question. If you would launch this poll, Valerie, poll number one, rate this following statement as it applies to your district or school. Some students in our district or school do not meet great level expectations in reading despite access to quality tier one instruction and tier two intervention. Great. Yeah, so it looks like we're pretty much all in agreement there that we all agree that there are some students who aren't making benchmark um, in our schools right now, that they aren't hitting those targets that we have um, for our students. But how about this one? How many students now in your district or school are making inadequate progress? So maybe they did meet a benchmark at one point, but maybe their progress has not been what you would hope it to be between benchmarks. Um, how many students would you say, despite receiving core quality tier one and tier two intervention? Great. So it looks like we, for the most part, agree that most of our, there are some students in our buildings, in our districts, in our schools that are not necessarily meeting benchmark and that they're also, there are some students who are not making adequate progress. And maybe some of those students overlap in some important ways. Um, you're not alone um, in thinking that there are some students in your schools. So I have two kind of anonymous date districts here, ISDs from the state of Michigan. Um, this data is taken from Acadians Reading Universal Screening data from January of 2019. Um, and you can see that in both schools, there are some percentage of students that are below benchmark, and there are some students who are well below benchmark, right? Um, and that's, that's what we would expect to find. And I'm presenting these data purposely without context um, because the demographic, geographic information isn't necessary here. The problem in both schools is the data. Some students are not meeting grade level expectations. We could spend all day talking about the causes, what schools could do better, um, but the reality is that both schools, some students aren't making those expectations and those students need our help. Um, we can work to prevent students from falling into these categories, but we need to do something for those students who are there right now. No blame. Um, this is basically the primary mindset of DBI. 
we're going to take principled action steps based on the contemplation of ongoing data. And maybe you could say this is a primary mind mindset of MTSS, right? We're trying to look at our data objectively and say, okay, what else should we be doing at tiers one and tier two? And with DBI, we say, and at tier three to support those students who are falling into this category. But it's not enough to look strictly at are students making benchmark or not, just at that universal screening data. We also need to ask ourselves, are students making good progress? Because we could have a student who falls below a benchmark, but they're making good progress, right? Our tier two supports are working. They're doing what we would expect them to do. Um, so here I'm using the progress pathway information in Acadians where it looks at the point before, so in this case, fall of 2019 to January of 2020 the growth that students did. And if you remember District A um, in the previous slide had a fairly, um, like about 16% of students who were below benchmark. But as you can see, 32% of students made below typical expectations and progress between those two checkpoints. So sometimes we are gonna see different students who fall into these categories. It's really important when we're talking about DBI that we talk about students who are not just below benchmark or even well below benchmark but also that we talk about students who meet a dual criteria. That is, that they're both below and making less than typical progress with all the supports in place. Um, the reason it's important to kind of consider this dual criteria is that we know that students can be behind for a lot of reasons. You are all very well aware of all those reasons that they could be behind. Um, and it's important that we identify the students who really, really need intensive supports because providing intensive supports and DBI is extremely difficult. It requires a lot of resources, as we're going to talk about in a little bit. Only a small number of students actually require it, so providing it to a student who doesn't require it is actually um, not going to help them very much. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're giving it to the right students, um, and that also that we're not giving it to so many students that we dilute the efficacy of the intensive intervention. It becomes less and less intense the more students we give it to. So we want to make sure that this is going to the right students who really need it. Um, and we also want to make sure, sure that we're giving it to students who have had the opportunity to receive quality tier one and tier two. So we're not going to jump to this level um, because just because a student is a little bit about low benchmark. But we're going to look at this and say, okay, make sure the student has been in school, a student who just got to your building, who, you know, has had inadequate experiences in the past in their educational career. We want to make sure we give them a chance to catch up before we're going to apply this most intensive step. The districts that we just saw and the data that we just saw in the last two slides are not outliers. So this is not, I don't present that data in any way to call out um, any ISDs or the state of Michigan or anything like that. We know that in the United States, 65% of fourth grade students did not meet proficiency standards in reading in 2017. We know 34% of fourth graders were below basic on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And what's more, um, we know that that number has been consistent since 1992 when they started administrating the NAEP. So for whatever reason, a large number of students aren't meeting our proficiency standards across the country and in Michigan it's the exact same thing. We see 53% half of all fourth grade students were either partially or not proficient in reading and about a third of students were not proficient at all. This, these numbers get more um, intense when we think about students with disabilities. In the United States 88% of fourth grade students with disabilities don't meet proficiency standards in reading and 70% were below basic. That's pretty staggering when you look at those numbers and the numbers are pretty much the same in Michigan where we have 85.2% of fourth graders um, partially or not proficient and 66.3 not proficient according to the most recent MSTEP um, results. And we could imagine that after all that's happened last spring and this fall that those numbers might be even greater this year if we had data um, to know exactly what was going on. What we know is that proficient reading is essential for school success in school and life. Um, being able to read is necessary across academic content areas. It's necessary for getting a job, for getting a house, for navigating any healthcare or other system in our society, right? It's very important. But that data indicate many students aren't proficient. And, that, and we know we need to do something. We know we need to get as many kids to proficient as possible. And I think all of you agree or you wouldn't be on a webinar like this right now. Um, and research suggests that if we do certain things, if we provide high quality core literacy instruction, 
we can prevent reading failure for a lot of students. Between 80 to 85% of students can make progress if they're provided with a solid core literacy um, curriculum from K all the way through 12, right? But research further suggests that some students, about 20 to 15% of students, will not make those benchmarks even with that quality core instruction. And we saw that if you think back to those districts that we saw from uh, Michigan, you saw this number that there were about between 16 and in that case 30 percent of students who did not meet the benchmarks who were not proficient right so what do we do then well we provide them with intervention and we know that reading intervention can be effective we have a lot of evidence to back that up and between 80 to 85 percent of students who get that extra push that extra intervention will do well they'll make they'll make the gains we'd expect them to make but even under perfect conditions, if we do everything right, if we are providing every single thing we should be providing to these students, two to 5% of students will not respond to evidence-based reading intervention and will require intensive support. And unfortunately, a disproportionate number of students with disabilities fall into this last group. So there will be, even if we get it right, if we spend all of our time and we perfectly implement tier one and tier two in our MTSS systems, there will still be some students who need additional layers of support. So I think it's helpful um, for me to kind of ground this in practice and to think about, okay, let's look at an average classroom of about 20 students. Maybe you have smaller classes in your, in your district or your school. Maybe you have larger ones, but just law of averages, we're gonna say there's 20 third graders in a class, okay? All of those students are receiving a quality core instruction about 120 minutes of literacy instruction per day. They're getting a research-based curriculum. Every day they experience daily systematic explicit instruction in both phonics, word reading, and reading comprehension. They're exposed to a high quality differentiated text on a daily basis. They work in differentiated groups. Perhaps you have a higher student with a lower student working in like a peer mediated model. Perhaps there's some small groups that are being pulled to the teacher's table. And accommodations are provided to any students as they need them. Maybe they need a special device or they need something else to help them, assisted notes, et cetera. But all students in the class are receiving this. What this looks like is that when we do that, when we're providing that good tier one support, 15 students in the class will meet or exceed grade level benchmarks with just that core instruction alone. So if we're doing all the good stuff, got it all in there, we can expect about 15 students on average in the class out of 20 or three quarters of the class or more to, to do well, right? Some students, about five students, are not gonna meet those benchmarks. So we're gonna do our universal screening and we're gonna find about five students who don't meet those initial expectations. Those students need to participate in something more. Pro probably a small group, validated reading intervention, maybe with a reading specialist, somebody, an intervention um, provider in the school. Um, and evidence suggests that four out of those five students, the ones that are indicated in blue here, will make good progress. They'll get to grade level with just that level of support, that additional kind of layer given to them. But one student, I've named him here Charlie. The names here are just random names from students I've encountered um, over the last 12 years. But one student here, Charlie, doesn't make progress despite getting what all of the students got in that classroom and getting that research-based intervention. Charlie still isn't making progress. And the thing is, there is a Charlie in almost every classroom, um, in almost every school, even if we do everything right. And so now I want you guys to think a little bit about this. I um, in your district or your school, what is most likely to happen to a student like Charlie? So after they've received that quality core one, they've got that research-based intervention, what's next for them? What, what is the most typical thing that would happen for them? Um, if you would respond to this poll, um, just suggest what would be the next step for, for your district or your school.
Great. So I think we were kind of all over the map here with our responses to this question, which was a little bit what I expected. Um, having worked with a lot of schools across the country, I've seen that there are kind of a couple tracks that people tend to take when students get to this level, um, get to a point like Charlie did. We see that students either are taken out of the MTSS framework and they're put into special education. And we kind of tend to view special ed as something other than that MTSS framework or we just continue the tier two intervention as is. So they just get more tier two. Maybe they go for another month or they get to stay in the group for longer, or we just move them into another tier two intervention group. Or maybe we just don't know what happens to them, or we return them to the classroom, the general ed classroom, and the special ed teacher is in the room. Um, and we think that by having the special ed teacher in the room, that student will get better. In, in a sense, we're giving them enhanced tier one. Um, instead of something different. Um, but what happens a lot, and I think what your answers kind of show are something that is similar to this medical term called failure to rescue. Um, the medical field has this term called failure to rescue, which basically means the inability to prevent death after a complication. Um, so if you think about it, it would be like if a, somebody needed to go on a ventilator, somebody had COVID-19, since this is what's in our head right now, this is where we're all at, um, and they go into the hospital, they're getting support, and eventually they need to go on a ventilator, right? If you refuse to put them on the ventilator because that was too intensive, that would be failure to rescue, right? And I think that when it comes to medicine, none of us really want that intensive support but none of us want that intensive support to be um, withheld from our loved ones or from us if it's needed, right? We want our, the lives of those that we love to be saved if they're in that situation. Um, and I think that what's happened in schools, unfortunately, is that sometimes we've done this thing where we have made it almost bad for a student to require this intensive support. That becomes a failure of the school um, and we kind of, we rate the school negatively. The same way healthcare had this more is worse approach for many years where hospitals receive their ratings based on the number of patients who were in the ICU, who had how many days they were in the ICU, et cetera. So it became a negative for them to go there. Um, but the thing is, it's support, right? Everyone's better served if we can prevent those adverse outcomes. But we need to remove the value judgments for just a second and think about this as more support is not necessarily bad or good. Support is based solely on what a student needs to survive. Um, and if in a classroom, one out of every 20 students might develop complications, we can expect that they might, even if we do it all right. When that a complication occurs, we don't need to start playing the blame game and figure out all the things we've done wrong in the past. What we need to do is to help that kid right now, right at this moment. Not after we fixed tier one and after we fixed tier two, but now. It's not unfair to help that student. It is unfair to withhold the help. Um, and unfortunately, what happens is that sometimes our neediest students end up getting less and not more. Um, so now I want you to think a little bit, um, with that in your head a little bit. Um, if an intervention is evidence-based, should it be able to help all struggling students achieve grade level expectations if delivered with fidelity as intended? Great, so most of you said you disagree, that if an intervention is evidence-based, it should be able to help all struggling students. But some of you were a little bit more neutral or on the fence and you said, well, yeah, if it's evidence-based, shouldn't it be able to help? And sometimes we have this tendency of thinking, well, if it's, if it's the right thing to do, we, it should work for everybody all the time. But the thing is, no method or system of individualized programming now available is adequate for all children in all classroom settings and under all circumstances. Uh, that was a quote from Sandy Doe and Phyllis Merkin from their 1977 article on DBI. And that quote is still true today. Um, we have to think about the fact that everything we apply in a school, in a district, all of the, the new reforms that come out, the new programs, the new whatever, all of that really 
is an experiment. <laughs> we are applying a hypothesis to our students. We may have theoretical rationale, we may have evidence to support it, but we don't have proof. We don't know that it will work. We only know that it won't work every single time. And if you think about that, all of us have experienced having something that's supposed to work um, applied to us. Maybe it's in a medical setting, maybe it's in some other setting where this is supposed to be how this works. And then it doesn't and it causes a lot of problems. Um, so I think um, some researchers, Doug Fuchs, Lynn Fuchs, and Sharon Vaughn wrote in 2014, we don't pretend to have a perfect solution. We'll be content if it helps those interested in reform and the education of struggling students to think productively about how to develop stronger frameworks. So it's not about, I think researchers want people to understand that they don't know the perfect solution and they don't expect the things they develop, the things they come up with to work for every student what they want to develop is kind of a research minded <laughs> um, way of thinking where you're looking at an individual case and an individual student and thinking what can i do for this student um, because it, it's not about finding the perfect program because there will be no perfect program that will mean that all 20 kids in the classroom will learn every single time um, and with that there's a lot of evidence to support the effectiveness of DBI, I, I just said that no program was going to work for all students 100% of the time, right? And now I'm talking about evidence supporting DBI. <laughs> um, but what I what I want to kind of point out here, DBI is not a program; it's a process. Um, and there is a lot of evidence for DBI. There's a lot of things that support it, um, but it's just evidence, and it requires critical thinking. It requires kind of um, a hypothesis. Um, recently, Jung and colleagues um, in 2018 completed a meta-analysis where they looked at 14 different studies of DBI, um, and the aggregate effect of DBI was found to be a Hedges G equal to 0.37. Um, that's a little tricky. I know effect sizes can be um, hard to kind of get in your brain, um, but uh, I've kind of put this graphic here to try to kind of help make that contextualized. So if you imagine a standardized assessment, think the Woodcock Johnson or something similar. Um, scores on a standardized assessment range from zero up to 200. The average score given to thousands and thousands and thousands of kids on that test is 100. Most students score 100 and about <laughs> the vast majority of students are in this blue range right here. Okay, that's where most kids will fall. So if you imagine that bell curve, it's right over that blue. Right there. Some students, of course, perform above 115, the cutoff at the top of the blue range, and some students perform below. Um, research from another meta-analysis by Gilmore, Fuchs, and Webby in 2019 suggests that a student with a disability is likely to score about 82.5 on an assessment like this. If we look at standard deviations below the mean, that's where typically we expect to see a student with disabilities performing. Um, so in that below average range, right, in that red zone. The effect of DBI 0.37 is about a third of a standard deviation. That means you would take a student who was at an 82.5 and it would raise their score to about an 88 or an 89. And that might not seem huge, but that's equivalent to moving a student from the below average, the significant risk category, into the average range. And that's a big difference. Um, and we see that this effect is consistent across academic areas. Um, we see a 0.47 effect. That's half of a standard deviation in spelling and writing. Um, that third of a deviation in math and about, again, a third of a deviation in reading. Moreover, this finding is particularly robust in that what they found when they did this meta-analysis is that they would have needed 300 more studies with a, an effect of zero in order to make that 0.37 effect a zero as well. So the aggregate effect is so robust, there's been, in each of those studies, it's pretty consistent um, that they would need all of that. And there's been a lot of research beyond what is in this uh, meta-analysis. Um, I said earlier that Sandy you know, and Phyllis Merkin kind of did that founding work from this. If you're using Dibbles right now, Dibbles comes from CBM work that was done by Sandino at University of Minnesota. Many of the researchers working today who have interventions that you know of and that you're working with 
even MTSS and RTI really have their foundations in the work of Standino. Um, and so this is a lot of the research that we talk about. This has really kind of a deep um, evidence base behind it. Um, and I should mention as well that at the end of this presentation, I'm going to have some references. They're in the slides in the overview handout as well. So if you're interested in saying, like, I don't believe her, there really isn't evidence for this, totally, you should not take my word for it. Go ahead and check out those studies. Um, there's some interesting um, information in all of those. And I, I think that those really, um, really kind of back up the evidence behind why DBI is important and who DBI um, is really meant to, to be used for. So with that being said, um, we're going to start talking now about what DBI is um, and kind of get into the nitty gritty of that DBI process. Before we do that, I want to ask you a poll to kind of get where you're feeling on this. Um, database individualization, DBI can best be described as, what do you think? Great. So I think most of you agreed that it was a research-based process. Some of you thought um, this is an evidence-based intervention platform. Well, let's get into that a little bit. Um, DBI is, in fact, a systematic method for using data to determine when and how to provide more intensive intervention. It is not a one-time fix. So it is not, um, unfortunately, an evidence-based platform. It is not a reading program or curriculum. And it's not a system of beliefs. It is a process, a process for intensifying intervention. Um, you will see, if you're looking through the literature, um, you might even hear this talked about by different people if you go to conferences in different terms, but people use a lot of different terms when they talk about DBI, such as experimental teaching, database decision-making, database program modification, database instruction, database intensification, and intensive intervention. Um, some of those terms have kind of alternative meanings. So we're going to use here um, Michigan MTSS Technical Assistance Center. We're going to call it database individualization. Um, but don't be surprised if you see some of these other terms out there um, in the world as you're researching this stuff yourself. Um, the most important aspect, the key or central thing that drives DBI is student data, individual student data, the graphed record of the student development is the most important aspect of DBI. If there's nothing else <laughs> that this um, presentation would be about, it's that their data is absolutely at the core, it's at the heart um, of, of this whole process. In DBI, it's a process for making decisions that are based not on hope, this should work, this is supposed to work, not on teacher judgment, I think this is best because I've done this before, not on anecdote, oh, the student really loves it, or I love using this program, my students are so engaged, or on what the experts say, quite honestly. DBI is about looking at one student's data, kind of ignoring all the other pieces of information and deciding what's gonna be best for this student. And so data absolutely forms the core of this program. Um, I think one thing that I'm kind of anxious for. I don't know if any of you are feeling this way too as we go into this year, maybe like year two of this pandemic um, effect. How much data is going to be collected on our students? Is there good data out there? Um, because if we want to intensify intervention for students who aren't making progress, we absolutely need data to do it. Um, and so I'm nervous that this data may, that it may be difficult to get the data that we normally would get on our students. Um, but in what we're talking about today, I think it's really important to lay out that data is key. Data is the core of everything um, we do. And when we talk about students um, who are in need of intensive intervention, I think it's really important to say the problem is never the child. The problem is never their disability. The problem is always the data. The student's performance, their data, is below that of their peers. So we need to kind of stop that blame game it's not poverty, it's not race, it's not bad parenting, it's not the previous teacher, it's not that the student isn't trying, and it's not the school. What we need to look at is be objective and look at that data. 
it, it requires us to kind of get in the mind of researchers to become experimental and think of it as if we were trying to identify the cure for a rare disease. There are a very small number of students with this specific profile. That's why all the things that are supposed to work haven't worked. And so we as teachers have to take on the role of researcher to find what's going to work for our student using their data. DBI has five basic steps. Number one, we need to select a validated intervention platform. That's up here at the top. Then we select a curriculum based measure to use for progress monitoring and we set a goal. And then we enter the DBI, the individualization phase. We implement that intervention in the progress monitoring measures. After a, a period of time, we evaluate how they've done. And if necessary, we make a new plan to adapt the intervention. And then we repeat steps three through five. We implement that new plan. A few weeks later, we evaluate. Do they need a change or not? And we plan again. All of this runs on data. Data is the core, it runs the whole process. So as I get through, I'm gonna go through each step kind of individually here. I'm gonna identify as well the data source that you're gonna need at each step that's gonna make that step work for you. Um, the first two steps kind of fall into the setup phase, how we prepare, and they may look pretty similar. Those of you who are implementing MTSS and working with teachers to implement MTSS, this is really what you do in tier two as well. Um, selecting a validated intervention platform, making the difference though is that we're going to make some initial adaptation to it, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then selecting a curriculum based measure to use for progress monitoring and setting, setting a goal. The first step is to, step, is to select an intervention, and I strongly suggest, the research strongly suggests, that you start with a standardized and validated tier two intervention, intensive intervention platform. Um, I say tier two because most research is going to be done primarily with tier two students. Um, the best studies will provide disaggregated results for students who would be more tier three and intensive. Um, so the best thing you can find is when there's results for those students. But we're gonna look for an intervention that has number one, evidence of efficacy for students below the 20th percentile, those students with significant risk. We want a program that is aligned to the student's individual needs, so it doesn't have anything that they don't need in it. So if they don't need comprehension support, an intervention that has a lot of comprehension support would probably not be the most important or the most aligned intervention. It also needs to hit all of their needs. So if the student does need comprehension support and word reading support, we wanna make sure there's equal amounts of both things in the intervention package for it to be aligned. We also want to make sure that that intervention is explicit. That means that there is direct modeling, there's guided um, practice with scaffolded support, and lots of opportunities for independent practice, cumulative review, um, and there's a clear scope and sequence where things build on the next thing to attend to students' background knowledge and prerequisite skills so that you see this prog progression, right? Um, we also want to see when we're selecting an intervention that's specifically for intensive intervention to use in a DBI setting, we really want to find interventions that integrate behavior and academic support, or if the intervention itself does not have integrate behavior support with academic support, we're probably going to want to make that accommodation. Uh, we're probably going to want to adapt the intervention right away to provide that because we know that the students who tend to have the most significant needs frequently also have very significant behavior needs as well. Um, those things tend to go very closely together. Um, and so when we're thinking about academics, we're also gonna think about behavior. And I could do this whole presentation um, from the perspective of behavior as well. And I would get to this slide and it would say that it integrates academics with behavioral support. Um, because whenever you're thinking about intensive intervention, you're always thinking about both things. Um, also, we're gonna look for interventions that attend to generalization and transfer and for interventions that provide multiple opportunities to respond for the student individually and to receive corrective feedback from the teacher. So the more opportunities the student has to respond, um, the more intensive that intervention platform is. Um, in order to do this, in order to pick out an intensive intervention platform, um, what we need to do, the data we need, number one, we need efficacy data on the interventions themselves. Um, when I say efficacy data, generally speaking, we want to get that from peer-reviewed research studies. We want to ask ourselves, is there evidence from this experimental study that there was a statistically significant effect 
And then how strong was that effect? Is this strong enough to make the change that I need to make for the student who's really, 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 really far behind um, on their reading level, right? So we were, are looking first and foremost at the intervention itself for efficacy data. And then number two, we're looking at the diagnostic data on our own students to kind of get a sense of their strengths and weaknesses in reading, if that's where we're providing DBI. But across the board, we might want to look at some other areas as well so that we can make sure that the intervention is not only strong, but also significantly aligned and just right for that student. So this might be something that's different from when you're picking out an intervention for tier two, right? When I'm picking out interventions for tier two, I'm looking for broad efficacy across a broader range, right? I'm not looking specifically at every single component for that student to see is this the perfect match for this student, which I'm looking, I might get a broader, more comprehensive intervention package of tier two. I might look for a more targeted piece for tier three or, or something different. Um, but you're gonna need a, a kind of a broad range of diagnostic data as well. So you've done your universal screening, you have some progress monitoring from tier two, but you're gonna want something else. You're gonna wanna maybe collect word reading information, maybe a phonemic awareness screener, maybe a phonics and word knowledge screener, maybe you're gonna to wanna to give them a spelling inventory, maybe you're gonna do a fluency probe. Um, you might wanna look at various aspects of their comprehension, their vocabulary, their verbal reasoning, their strategy use, their background knowledge. Um, and you're probably also gonna to wanna to get some information about behavior. You might wanna do um, an observation like an interval assessment, maybe even a functional behavior as assessment if that um, is something that's warranted. This is not in any way an exhaustive list of diagnostics that you might use. And if we were talking about math today, this would be a whole different list. I would have calculation and problem solving here. Um, if this was writing, I might have spelling, I might have letter formation, other things like that. If this was behaviors focused, it might say social skills and attention and, and other things like that. Um, so the point is you wanna gather as much information on the interventions and on the students so that you can find the perfect match intervention for them. Um, some characteristics as you're thinking about validated intensive intervention platforms to keep in mind. I suggest that a scripted curriculum um, is a good place to start. Um, that you should look for a systematic scope and sequence of instruction. Um, that you should look for scaffolded support for student practice. Um, and generally speaking, you should look for interventions that were designed to be delivered in small groups. So not whole class curriculums, but small group, um, and that they were developed and tested in a research setting. I know right now, some of you are like getting ready to type your comment. Um, so I think some practitioners will be really kind of um, upset. I was prepared for most people to be upset by the word scripted. Um, because I think a lot of people, and I will include myself in this group, especially when I was in the classroom, felt that it hindered my creativity um, and it downplayed the expertise of teachers when we talked about picking scripted curriculum. Like, why would you do that? Um, however, after spending six years developing curriculum like this and spending all day, <laughs> every day doing it and then implementing it with 120 students and collecting audio files on every single one and going through the audio files and collecting feedback from each one and all the data and then rewriting the whole thing again. Um, I know how difficult it is to come up with the perfect words to say. Um, and I think that sometimes when we start our um, interventions and we go into these intensive interventions, if our whole effort goes into designing perfect text and perfect workbooks and getting all, cobbling all these pieces together, we will not put our effort where it needs to be, which is evaluating the student data and making evidence-based um, adaptations to that program. So I suggest that a script be a starting point. Um, and I, I always think in my head, maybe this is crazy, but I think of Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep is, nobody would question her creativity or her craft when she's acting, right? She's using a script, the words are written for her, but it's what she does with that script that's impressive. And I think that's exactly what choosing a really strong validated intervention platform as your jumping off point for DBI is so important. It allows you to take those words and to be free, to be present with your students, um, to use your creativity and adapt. I think that not doing that, not starting with that as your base, means it's gonna be way harder than it needs to be, and DBI is very hard, <laughs> as we're gonna talk about in a minute. All right, so thinking about that, what I've just talked about, 
um, which of these is not a good place to research validated and intensive intervention platforms. Great. So yeah, we all kind of are in agreement that teachers pay teachers isn't where we should be going to find a validated intervention platform. Um, however, I think Cheryl, you're spot on that maybe in special ed, it, it might be something that people are more into the scripted idea than in gen ed. But I think in across the board, whether we're talking about special ed or gen ed, I think that whether we know in our heads that evidence-based interventions aren't found on teachers pay teachers, we also tend to go there because it's easy and it's right, it's available, right? We can search it and find it, print it. Um, same with Pinterest, right? Um, I think that we really have to counteract that. We have to confront it and say, what is the evidence for the interventions that I'm using right now? How do I know and where did I find this? Um, and sometimes we have to really interrogate ourselves and what we're using in our classroom um, to see where did this come from? And some of these sources that are listed here, National Center for Intensive Intervention, What Works Clearinghouse, The Best Evidence Encyclopedia, um, published meta-analyses of reading intervention, all of those are great places to find out if something is in fact evidence-based. So with that in your head, um, think about the intervention platforms that are currently in use in your district or school. Have those intervention platforms been empirically tested? That is validated by research? Do you know, have you seen the studies? Just kind of think through what intervention platforms are we using right now? Um, and are those empirically tested? Have they been tested? Great. Yeah, so I think we were kind of, we were pretty across the board on this. Uh, many of you were neutral about this, uh, maybe because some of the interventions you're using are and some of the interventions you're maybe using in your schools or districts aren't, um, or maybe you're not sure if they are. Um, I could have put on that last side, I had teachers pay teachers, which is pretty obvious, but I could have also put something like publishers, um, because publishers will promote their curriculum. Um, they come to your district, they come to your school with their glossy, um, things and they haven't actually validated that through in, through research um, and while those curriculums might work well those curricula might <laughs> work well in a tier one setting um, because you would be able to adapt them to your students when we're talking about students who need the most intensive level of support it's so important that what we're using with them be something that's empirically tested that we start with the best possible and then move from there all right Another question that I think we need to ask ourselves when we're thinking about the intensive intervention platforms or just the interventions in general that we're using right now, um, would you say the literacy intervention platforms currently in use in your district or school, do they incorporate the principles of explicit instruction? That is direct teacher modeling, um, guided practice with scaffolded supports, lots of independent practice, cumulative review, um, support for prior knowledge, assessment, Great. Thank you for that. Yeah, so many of you agree that your the interventions you're using provide opportunities for explicit instruction. Um, another key feature of explicit and systematic instruction is a clear scope and sequence of skills. Um, so this is not a hit or miss approach. Um, so something that's a like a guided reading or a level of literacy. Um, I don't say this um, to be. Um, to to call out anything in particular, but. Um, those programs where I go into the reading room and I select books at my students level um, and then maybe we touch on some word study from that book um, that's not following a systematic scope and sequence that is not explicit instruction when I say direct modeling it's direct modeling of specific strategies so um, I think that there are some confusion out there in terms of what's being used and students who need intensive support 
definitely require explicit instruction and it must be more explicit than what we need for our tier two student, students who are receiving tier two, two supports and those students who are just receiving tier one supports, right? They need the most explicit. Um, and so explicit instruction is really um, important. Um, that the, the things that we're choosing to use incorporate some components of explicit instruction. Um, okay, so that's step one, is to select that validated intervention platform. Okay, that's the first step. And um, Nicole, thank you for your comment that the word intervention is a little, it is a little tough. And I know from a middle school and a secondary setting, um, high school and middle school, it's definitely different um, because you have more things like a read 180 um, that's standing in. There are fewer, um, certainly many fewer um, intervention packages and intervention platforms that exist. Um, that's definitely one of the biggest issues we see in middle school and high school, um, among other things that make DBI and make intervention difficult in the secondary setting for sure. Um, I agree with you. There are some out there. Um, I'd be happy to send you a list or some sources as well at the end. So feel free to touch base with me and I can send you some links to that. And I know you could reach out to some other technical assistance providers who um, even have more um, expertise in this area than I do. Um, but kind of switching gears to go to step two. So we've selected a tier one, a validated intervention platform. Step two is going to be um, to choose a curriculum-based measure. Um, a curriculum-based measure is just basically a broad indicator of progress. So if you think in a medical field, taking your temperature um, says something's wrong if your temperature is too high. It does not say what is wrong. It could be any number of infections that are causing you to have a temperature, right? It could be a virus, could be a bacterial infection, but either way your temperature is up, which would lead you to do more. That's basically what a CBM is in education, right? It's something that provides a broad indicator that something is wrong. They also need to be sensitive to change um, over time, and they need to kind of represent broadly what the whole curriculum would look like. That's why oral reading fluency is a good curriculum-based measure, because you use probes that are all written at the same level, say at a third grade level, and so when a student reads more words on a text that's written at the same level and is equated across a number of dimensions to all the other texts, that represents real growth, right? As opposed to mastery of a set of skills. Um, Curriculum-based measures um, must be easy and efficient to administer. They take between one to three minutes. They have standardized administration procedures and they're technically adequate. When I'm selecting a curriculum-based measure for a student who is in need of intensive intervention who needs DBI, um, I might pick a curriculum-based measure that is different than the one that I'm using for universal screening. So say you have a kindergarten student, maybe they use letter and naming fluency, nonsense word fluency, and phoning segmentation fluency, um, though an initial sound fluency maybe. Okay, they have those things as their universal screening. But I might pick just one of those for the CBM that I'm going to use for DBI to do this work with um, in later grades. I may choose phoneme, se phoneme segmentation fluency for a student who's a fourth grader, even though that isn't the skill that they're being tested on at universal screening. So I'm going to use the curriculum-based measure that's most appropriate for the student's level and where I'm going to be targeting them for intervention, what I'm gonna be working on with them. You need to, when you're thinking about choosing a CBM for your student, think about number one, technical adequacy data. Is there evidence that this is sound, that this has been done with lots of students, that it provides statistically significant and consistent data for students? Because I'm gonna be basing my, my decisions on this data, so it's really important that that data be good. So I, this is where something like a running record has problems because it doesn't have that technical adequacy data. So yes, I'm getting information about the student's oral reading fluency from moment to moment, but it is not getting, um, really getting at the underlying um, things that that student needs and I can't base my decisions on it. Um, we also need to collect baseline data on the student on that measure and you think what is the student's current median score right now and then we also need benchmark data. Where do we need them by the end of the year? What is the kind of point where they need to reach by the end of the year? So we're thinking through all of these things as we select the right 
um, CBM that we're going to use for our students. So many of you are using a cadence right now or you're working with districts that are using a cadence right now. Um, formerly Dibbles, maybe somebody's using Ames Web. There are many other versions out there and they offer a variety of different probes in different um, ways. But when you're thinking about a student's DBI, you want to pick a measure, a, something that you're going to measure, um, and that's going to be the CBM that you use to base your decisions on. Also incorporated in this step, we want to be setting up, so we've picked our intervention and we're setting up kind of the system by which we're going to know if our program is working or not. So you're going to want to select the right measure for your student. If the student has a, like their priority deficit is in phonemic awareness, I'm probably using phoneme segmentation. If their primary deficit is in phonics, I'm probably going to use something like the nonsense word fluency. If their primary deficit is in fluency, I'm probably going to use an ORF. If their primary deficit is in comprehension, it's not perfect, but I'm probably going to use the close. Okay, so, and I'm selecting that, and I'm also selecting the grade level that's most appropriate for the student to monitor their progress with. Um, I'm going to then administer about three of those probes to establish a baseline, a median score. I mean, if you look at this graph over here, you see this red dot. That red dot would be the student's score at baseline, right? That's that median score right there at benchmark, okay? Then I'm going to set a goal. That goal might be grade level benchmark, but it might also be something else depending on what's reasonable. I want this to be an ambitious goal. My goal is to get that student back to grade level eventually, but I might recognize that this is a two or three year project, right? Two years of growth is pretty ambitious for a student who hasn't made any growth for three years. So I might say if this is a fifth grader who's, who's kind of at a maybe a kindergarten first grade level in terms of their phoneme segment, segmentation fluency or their nonsense word fluency. I might set that goal as like by the end of the second grade benchmark for nonsense word fluency. That might be where I set it. Those are like complicated decisions and complicated conversations that we would have in another time, but that's kind of the idea of how you're gonna set this goal. You then are going to draw a line from the baseline point, that little red dot over in your left corner all the way up to that benchmark goal, right? On the bottom of the graph, you're going to determine when you're going to administer your progress monitoring measure. It's important when you're thinking about, okay, when am I gonna administer this progress monitoring measure, that you set up not only that like I'm gonna do it every week, but that you set up the day of the week that you're gonna do it, the time of the, week, of the day that you're gonna do it, who's going to do it, where they're gonna do it, how they're gonna do it. Um, so that it is set in stone. This is how this, this is going to be collected. I would suggest so that it's consistent that maybe avoid Mondays and Fridays because those tend to be the days most often missed for holidays or other things um, to pick a day in the middle of the week. You may choose to do it Tuesday and Thursday twice a week, um, but this would be a decision that you would make with your team before you even begin doing anything with the student. Okay, this is all happening. You've selected your measure, you've selected your validated platform, and now you're setting this up before you get started implementing it. Um, the other thing you're gonna wanna discuss before you get started is that you're gonna wanna set up when is it that I'm going to review this data to see if the student is on track. So if you see these dark lines on the graph here, those are spaced about six weeks apart. So what I'm saying is I'm setting up this graph here for the student. I'm going to use the nonsense word fluency, correct letter sounds sequences as my measure. The student is currently at a 12. I want them to get to about a 43 by the end of week 18. So I've drawn my line and I'm going to administer it every Wednesday, the middle of the week, middle of the day. And I am going to every six weeks review my progress in that, that six week time frame to decide if the student is on track to make their goal or not. Two important things here that matter so much when we're doing this. You need fidelity times time to get good data. We must administer this at basically the same time each week and get consistent data and do it in a consistent way so that the data matters. If I pad the numbers at all, if I don't stop my stopwatch and I let the kid get an extra 30 seconds one week, that's not valid data, right? That, that's not showing where that student actually is right now. So I can't use that data to make a good decision. I also need to give myself time. Um, one point doesn't make a line. Two points, yes, you can draw a line, but it doesn't tell me a trend yet. 
even three points is not enough to give me a really strong evidence of a trend. I need several points to be able to see a difference for this student. So it's so important that we collect this data like consistently over time so that we can start to see whether the student is going up or down or if they're all over the map because all of that information is what we're going to use to make our decisions um, as we get into this next phase. Okay, quick check for understanding here. Sorry, this is probably obvious for most of you, but which of these is not an example of a curriculum-based measure? Great. So most of you said um, correctly running record. Um, that is not a curriculum based measure. Can that be interesting in terms of diagnostic information? Sure. But it is not a curriculum based measure. So that's not what I can graph to make decisions on. Um, maze and close and, and some people have put nonsense where have suggested nonsense where fluency. This is true as well. Um, are not CBMs. They do have technical adequacy data quite a bit. They correlate very strongly with oral reading fluency. Um, they tend to correlate strongly with foundational skills. They're not right for every student. Um, and so it's really a matter of which one is the one that targets what my student needs um, based on what I'm providing intensive intervention for. Um, for a student who has a comprehension only deficit, for example, maze is far from perfect, close is far from perfect, um, but it's the closest I can probably get to getting a really good, um, data point that's sensitive to change and equated across the board. Um, my hope is that in the coming years we're going to have better and better comprehension only um, <laughs> measures of CBMs, but for right now it is our best option. Um, but yes, I, I agree with those of you who said, oh, amazing close is weird, and it, it is. It is weird sometimes. Um, but remember these are, um, these are indicators, like taking your blood pressure or your temperature. We don't use them to decide what to change. We just use them to decide that a change is needed. Um, so that's a really important distinction when we're thinking about that. The running record might provide information that tells you what to change, but it's not gonna tell you when a change is needed because those, those poll or those probes that you're using for your running record are not equated. They're not technically the same as all the other ones. Um, so I had a question from Cheryl. Isn't a comprehension issue usually a symptom of another issue like fluency or background knowledge or vocab rather than comp itself? And very often, Cheryl, you're dead on. Um, comprehension is often a symptom. Fluency and comprehension are super, super well correlated, um, inten intensely correlated, right? However, there are students, there are, there are not a ton of them. <laughs> there are a very small minority of students that we work with who do truly have a comprehension only deficit. Um, I've worked with several of them and it was truly comprehension only. Their, their fluency was really strong, even above grade level. Um, their phonemic awareness was good. Their background knowledge was actually pretty good. Their vocabulary was pretty good, but their oral comprehension was, in, was not there at all. Um, their ability to, to apply problem solving strategies. It gets into other areas of attention and working memory and all that other stuff that might've been implicated, but it does exist. It is, it is an area that does exist. Um, so if you run into one of those students, um, they're some of the most rare um, students that you could encounter. Those students do truly have comp only deficits. I've worked with them. Um, and it's, it's, it's real. It's as, as real as another type of deficit would be. Um, but you're dead on that often we're going to look at those other areas first, oral reading, word reading, um, and vocabulary, and some of those other areas first. You're dead on with that. Okay, so we've just gone through kind of the setup phase, selecting a validated intervention, selecting our curriculum-based measure. Now we're gonna move into the individualization phase with that student. This is what really sets DBI apart from like a tier two intervention platform. Um, this is the part of it that is really kind of the heart and soul of doing DBI. Okay, there's three steps here. We implement, our intervention that we selected in that progress monitoring as decided earlier. At that predetermined interval, we evaluate progress to determine if a change is necessary. 
And if a change is deemed necessary, if that data indicate it, we're gonna make a plan to intensify the intervention. And we're gonna repeat those steps. We're gonna then implement that plan, and then we're gonna evaluate again, plan again as necessary, et cetera. And round and round we'll go until the student reaches the level, they've achieved all their goals, and they, they've normalized their data. So their data is where we would expect it to be for a student at their grade level. That's kind of what we're hoping to get to. Kind of as we get into this part of the process, the individualization phase, I think it's important to kind of contrast a standard intervention, something that you might be providing in tier two, with DBI. Um, like I said earlier, a standard intervention we look at as a one-time fix. This is something that has been tested and shown to be effective for students, generally speaking. So for most students who get this, this has been shown to give them a boost, to give them a bump, right? If delivered exactly as it's designed. DBI is not a one-time fix. It's not a single program. It's a systematic process. So it's very different in that sense. Um, with a standard intervention, we're going to have fidelity to the standard procedures. Whatever the manual says, whatever the, the process is, we stick to it. We provide it just as it says. With DBI, we're going to make frequent instructional adaptations. We're, we're going to make changes to that intervention platform based on what our student needs. Um, standard interventions are provided in small groups between six to eight students. Individualized interventions will be provided in groups of one to three, okay, in DBI. With a standard intervention, intensity is determined by the intervention developer. So whatever is in that package is as intense as it's going to be. In DBI, we're increasing the intensity systematically, bit by bit by bit, based on the student needs until we find what needs to work. Okay? Um, I need to point out really quickly, because I know this is something that comes up a lot. We say DBI, the instruction is individualized. That is, you're going to make individual adaptations to the curriculum, the dosage, the amount of guided practice, et cetera. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be providing it with a student one-to-one. -one. It might be, but not always. Okay? I might have flexible groups where the student participates in a small group with two to three students who also require that intervention. Sometimes I might pull that student aside for a few extra minutes with a paraprofessional or maybe with me or with another teacher for extra practice. There's flexible ways of doing this, right? So when I say this, some people kind of are like, well, we don't have resources for one-to-one. -one. And that's very, very possible. Um, so it's not always we don't mean one by one, one-to-one. -one. What we mean is that what you're providing to that student is individualized to them. So they might be getting pieces that are different from other students in the group. Um, so imagine what this looks like. You have a student who has been participating in a phonics for reading or rewards with a small group of students who are in tier two. But that student isn't making progress. I think that phonics for reading is addressing many of the student's weaknesses though. So I might keep that student in their tier two group, but I'm gonna add some additional practice in phonemic awareness because I don't think it's quite enough in the phonics for reading group, okay? So the special education teacher maybe or the speech and language pathologist is gonna provide that additional 10 minutes per day of phonemic awareness instruction. That student might work with me separately because of behavior. Maybe I realize that they're having trouble with this big group so I might pull them aside. Or I might realize they're not keeping up, they need to go at a slower pace, and I might have to kind of move them into a separate group. There's lots of ways to intensify instruction, which we're gonna talk about in a, in a minute. Group size, that one-to-one -one is just one of those ways, okay? Um, so, that being said, the third step in our DBI process is to implement the intervention. Um, there's a picture of a blueprint here because you have set up when you picked that intervention out and you've selected your um, CBM that we are going to, uh, we've made a plan and now we're going to implement our plan for our individual student with fidelity. Whatever the intended dosage was, the number of minutes per day we said we were going to do, the group size we said we were going to do, the place the procedures, we're gonna follow the protocols as we set them out. If we're skipping one portion or we're slowing it down, we're gonna do that. Um, we're gonna ensure that everybody who's providing it has the training they need, the resources they need to provide it with fidelity. And we're also gonna implement our progress monitoring with fidelity too. We're gonna to follow the standard procedures, we're gonna to stick to our plan, okay? In a research setting, fidelity is really, really important. If a program isn't implemented with fidelity by all the members of a research team, it's impossible to know if the intervention was effective. Um, this affects both our ability to like look at the internal validity 
of the study. Like, is it truly what we did? But it also means it's harder to give it external validity because somebody looking at this intervention from the outside isn't going to know what the actual active ingredient is. In DBI, the teacher clinician is acting as the researcher with their individual students. So it's impossible to draw valid conclusions about what's working and what's not if you're not implementing with fidelity what you said you were going to do with that student. So if it's changing every day that that student is coming and you're doing a different thing, it's going to be impossible to know what's really working or what's not working for that student. Um, the data you need at this step is fidelity. Remember I said data is core. Data is what makes this whole thing work. So you need data at each step. At step three, the most important data is our fidelity data. Dosage data, how many minutes is the student getting the support they need? How often? What size are the groups? How many opportunities did they get to practice their skills? How much reading did they do, et cetera? We're also gonna wanna know student behavior and engagement data. Were they attending during the intervention? Did they give good effort? Were they motivated? How do they get along with the other kids in the group? Um, do they have issues that are causing, with the other students that are causing them to miss parts of the instruction because they're arguing with another student or they, they feel nervous to respond because of that, the presence of this other student, et cetera. We're also gonna look at adherence data. Are we following those planned procedures? So if I said I'm gonna do five minutes of phonemic awareness, am I really doing phonemic awareness for those five minutes? Am I really doing fluency reading each day for the amount of time that I said I was gonna do? Did we actually do the procedures that are in the manual? Those are the kind of things I'm looking for. And I'm also looking for a CBM administration data too. Did it happen every week? Did it get implemented the way I wanna get it implemented? Was the data entered the way I wanted it entered? Am I sure that the data is, is pure? I need all of this because step four, evaluate relies on good data, okay? At a predetermined point, we are gonna make a decision to evaluate our data. I'm suggesting here that you probably need a minimum of six data points before you can make an evaluation. You um, may kind of, that may look like a lot. Maybe you've heard of three data points before. Um, you can do a smaller number but that's not going to be very reliable. Um, imagine that I have three data points. One point is way higher or lower than the others. What I won't know is if that day was an outlier because now I only have those other two points next to it. And I won't know um, what the true trend is because that one data point is gonna really affect the trend. It's gonna either pull it way up or pull down. So more points gives me kind of a, a more stable trend line to tell me if what I'm doing is working or not. And I also need to give time for a change to occur. So especially if you're talking about a comprehension intervention, I really need to give some time to see if this takes effect, if the student learns it. If I'm spending the first two weeks kind of teaching the basic strategies in this program, I can't really expect a giant jump to happen on those first two weeks. I need a few more weeks to kind of watch and see what's gonna happen with that trend. So that's why I suggest you need a few more um, data points. Either way, you need to kind of predetermine before you start this, when am I gonna review data? And whenever you say, that's when you're gonna sit down with your team and you're gonna have a discussion with the graph in front of you and say, is the student on track to meet their goals? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, we'll continue implementation as we were doing before. That means what we've been doing has been working. If the answer is no, if they're not on track, we're gonna to go to step five. Um, the most important thing here to keep in mind, at some point, you will have to make a change. So at some point, that's what it's going to have to be. Um, another point too, if you're using six data points in most of those, the literature on DBI, most of those published studies that I mentioned earlier, they've implemented CBMs or they've provided CBMs two times a week. So that means that you'd be making changes every three to four weeks. So well, six data points might seem like a lot. If you collect data twice a week, that would be more. So this is, it's an individual decision that you have to make with your team and with that student in mind. Um, and, and that's not something we can necessarily say in this session um, <laughs> exactly how you would lay that out. Okay. If you look at this graph here, so you see these first six points that the student ha has, we see this like kind of thin red line that's behind it. That's the trend for that student based on those six points for the six weeks. 
we can see clearly that that line, if that line were to continue, the student is not going to meet their goal by the end of the year. So when we get to this point, week six, we know we need to make a change. So at that point, we are going to say with our team, this is not adequate. Now the clock starts again for the second set. So we are gonna collect six more weeks of data. We've made, we're gonna make a change and then we're gonna do it again. At this next evaluation point, we're just looking at those six weeks that were right behind it. We're not looking back at this one, we're looking at this set. So we're, we're evaluating whether the intervention as implemented plus the adaptation we made over here was effective. Once again, we see that the student is not on track to meet their goal. The red line is not going to meet. So we decide to make a change again. Implement that change for six weeks. After six weeks, we evaluate. Now the student has made pretty remarkable progress. They're not on their goal line yet, but if they were to keep going on this trajectory, they're definitely going to hit their goal. So whatever we did here seems to have worked. So we're probably going to keep implementing whatever that was exactly as we were doing it again for the next set of data. And we would keep doing that. So every six weeks we would sit down again with our team and decide, is it time to make a change? Yes or no. Here, the progress monitoring data obviously is key. This is where you're actually sitting down with your data on your graph and you're looking, okay, how are we doing? We need about six to eight points really if we want to determine level and trend. We need our data to be reliable and error free. And then we need to be, it needs to be administered consistently. So if there is an individual in your building for whom the student really like doesn't do as well <laughs> when they do their progress monitoring, then it's not going to be a good graph. The more consistent that administration is, the better it will be um, to actually say, yes, this is due to growth in the student and not some other factor in the building. We need that information because we need that to plan our instruction. We need that to decide is a instructional change required? And when it is, we're gonna make a new plan. When we need to make a plan, our progress monitoring data that we used in step four only told us that a change was needed. It did not necessarily tell us anything about what change we need to make. We are probably gonna to need to collect some more diagnostic data to help us make a change. So with our team, we're going to have to sit there after we've decided a change is needed and figure out, okay, what can we do to intensify this intervention? I like to think of this as like um, a mixer at a soundboard, kind of turning up different knobs bit by bit till we get to where we need to go. This is without question the most difficult part of the DBI process. Um, we have to, it's, it's really challenging. It takes a lot of time to figure out how to do this. Um, there's a great article by Fuchs, Fuchs and Malone from 2017 um, on the taxonomy of intervention intensity. And I think that's a really good tool to guide discussions about this, um, but it takes practice. And this is definitely something to be done in a team um, all together as we figure this out. There are lots of things we can intensify for the student. We might intensify the alignment, so maybe more phonemic awareness, less fluency. Maybe more fluency, less phonemic awareness to make it more aligned to what that student needs. Maybe we need to add some vocabulary to this intervention because the student is really struggling with the comprehension piece. Um, we might make a change to intensify the comprehensiveness. So I've been providing some direct modeling, but the student doesn't seem to be understanding it. So I'm going to model that strategy again, maybe in smaller pieces so they can get pieces of it. Or I'm gonna give them more guided practice and more scaffolded support or more independent practice to support automaticity. Um, I might increase the dosage. So this, I might say that a smaller group is needed, that more time is needed, or maybe both. I might intensify attention to transfer. So I might teach them some self-regulation strategies, give them like a card to carry with them or some sort of mnemonic device to help them in different settings. We might practice the skill in another setting in the whole, group classroom somewhere else to help them transfer the skill somewhere else. Or we might intensify the behavioral support if we think that that's the reason the student is not benefiting from this intervention as we'd hope. So there's lots of different ways that we can intensify this intervention. There's lots of things we can do. The key is that we're going to do something. We're going to make a new plan to take what we were doing with that intensive intervention platform and make it just a little bit more intense. 
we always want to make a small number of adaptations at a time so that we're able to evaluate just that piece, that, those adaptations kind of on their own. So if I make a ton of changes, I'm not going to know which one of those was important or not. So I'm going to make kind of whatever, as a team, we decide is the most important, most effective thing to change right now. You're going to need lots of um, additional diagnostic data. You might want to do a phonics screener, phonemic awareness screener, a spelling inventory, maybe a functional behavior analysis, behavioral observation, vocabulary screener, writing sample, all sorts of different things that you might choose to look at for the student if you're like, what is going on here? What's missing? What are, what are we not getting? The more data we have, the better we can find the right plan I and mean, not waste time trying ineffective things. Right, one on one is extremely difficult to provide in a school. So I try all the other intensifications before I go there because I, I want to see what works before I can prove that yes, that is that's the only way the student is going to get it. Um, so I need to show that I've tried these other things before I get to that because I know how hard it is for the student and for us to provide that. So getting the right diagnostic data, getting all of it together can help inform that decision making process. And then you repeat. Whatever you decide as a team you're gonna implement, you're gonna implement that new plan, the intervention plus, <laughs> if you will, with fidelity again. So I'm gonna start doing that. If I said I was gonna increase my dosage, I'm going to increase my dosage, and they're gonna get that for six more weeks or whatever, however many weeks you've decided. And then I'm gonna evaluate data again. I say, did that work? Did the plan plus work? If it didn't, I'm gonna make another change. If it did work, I'm gonna keep implementing with Fidelity again. And I'm gonna keep repeating this process again and again um, until the student's data matches that of their peers. Until the thing that I'm hoping will get on level, maybe it's their oral reading fluency, whatever it is, that will match, that will match where their peers are. It's really important to remember that this process will take time um, and that you will have to make instructional changes. That at some point, you will have to make instructional changes, or we would say that, yes, there are interventions that work for every student every time. That's not the case. <laughs> Eventually, changes will have to be made. That is what DPI is about. It's about systematically intensifying intervention until we find the right match, the right mix that works for that individual student. All right, so that's a complex process. <laughs> that's a broad overview of it. Um, I'm sure many of you are wondering, how does this fit into an MTSS framework? Um, how does this fit into what we're doing? I know you guys are well acquainted with the um, practice profile, um, the MTSS um, practice profile that was put out by MDE and Michigan um, MTSS TAC Technical Assistance Center. Um, there are components that we have identified as essential to MTSS, among them team-based leadership, tiered delivery systems, selection and implementation of instruction interventions and supports, comprehension screening and assessment, and continuous database decision making. These are the core components of MTSS, but these are also the core components of DBI, right? There's still team-based decision making. You're still operating within that tiered delivery system. You're still selecting and implementing interventions and supports. You're using screening and assessment and you're making decisions on data. The, the core components of MTSS are the core components of DBI. And it really belongs within an MTS framework. I know most often we draw kind of the tiered <laughs> triangle, if you will, with kind of the bottom of the triangle is tier one, the middle is tier two, and the top is tier three. What I think it's a little missed in that drawing is that tier one is everybody. Every single student is in tier one. All students need that, 100% of students. All students need to receive core literacy instruction. All students need about 90 to 120 minutes a day of that in elementary school, a little less than in middle and high school, right? That is provided in the whole class setting to all students. All students benefit from that, including those students who might be considered to be in tier two or who might be considered to be in tier three. Um, 15 to 20% of students require intensive or require intervention in addition to this core instruction. They're getting a validated intervention platform, maybe 30 to 45 minutes per day in a small group, six to eight students, on top of their tier one intervention. 
And then there's another group of students, a small group of students, two to 5% of students. We, you know, Charlie was my example student who are getting this core instruction. They're getting this validated intervention and they still need more, more intensive support. So Charlie is getting tier one plus tier two plus tier three. It's not different, it's not separate, it's additive. In MTSS, the tiers are additive. They're not separate. It's not like you leave one and you're in another one and you're, not, you're no longer part of the group below. You're adding it on until you find what works. This is because providing tier two intervention to a high percentage of students dilutes the quality of the tier two intervention. Many of you have probably seen this in your school. If you have too many kids that are receiving tier two, now you have groups of 30 kids. Now you have 20 students in a room and it's no longer really the validated intervention that you were hoping to provide. It's not targeted, it's not, a, it's not what they need. So it dilutes the efficacy. The same is true in tier three. Um, and tier three is more intense. <laughs> it's more intense than tier two. Um, it's, more it's more time, more individualized, more comprehensive. Um, the last few years I've been working on this intervention platform and we would collect data from teachers about what they were doing in tier two and tier three with their students. And by and large, what we were seeing is that tier two and tier three were exactly the same, same number of students, same number of minutes, um, same basic things that were being addressed in both, in both classrooms at the same time. Tier three should be more intensive should be more time, more individualized, more comprehensive. And because of that, it's really hard to do to a lot of, for a lot of students. So it's really important that we are doing as much as we can in tier one and as much as we can in tier two. Um, MTSS works best when there's a strong tier one and tier two. But even with that, there will still be some students who are gonna need tier three and that's okay. Right, we're removing those value judgments and just applying support as needed based on what that student needs to thrive in our school. So let's return to kind of this in practice view. I showed you earlier Mr. Smith's hypothetical class, right? And how Mr. Smith is the core instructor, he's the teacher of record for that room. But all teachers in the building, all adults in the building, all personnel share responsibility. That's what the beauty of MTSS is is that we're all working together for all students. So Mr. Smith is the teacher of record. He's providing that tier one core instruction to all 20 kids in the room. Five of those students also need some validated small group intervention. So maybe they're in a word reading intervention like rewards or phonics for, read, for reading. Maybe they're in a fluency intervention like read naturally or in a comprehension intervention like reading PI, okay? Those students are receiving that additional layer of support. And four of those students who are seeing the reading interventionist are making really good progress. Um, and so actually by the end of the year, they return to core instruction. Maybe some new students need that intervention now, right? But one student needs more. And that student is provided an additional layer of support from someone like a teacher clinician, might be a special ed teacher, might be someone else in the building, might be a speech and language pathologist, might be the school psychologist, who knows who it is in the building. The point is that that student needs an additional layer of support um, so that we're all working together for all the students in our room. All right, sorry, I've been talking for quite a bit of time there. So I wanna check in with you a little bit here. Read this statement for me. Tier three supports for students should be quantitatively more intensive than supports for tier two students. Um, or for students who are in tier two, I should say. Um, meaning they should be provided for longer duration in smaller groups, et cetera. All right, great. So you guys mostly agreed with that because, and you're right on, tier two and tier three should be different, right? I think somebody has said many times the definition of insanity, right, is doing the same thing over and over and expecting the same result. I think that if we continue to give students the exact same level of support that we gave them in tier two, we can't expect a different outcome from that. 
right? That, that would be crazy to expect it. Um, and so it should be quantitatively different, but I understand why we would disagree with this statement too, because there are limits to our day, right? We only have these students between eight and three, and we have to make sure they get math and recess and lunch and music and PE and science and social studies and all the other things in their day. So how do we make it more intense? And so it can't be the only way that tier three is more than tier two. So question number two, um, tier three supports for students should be qualitatively more intensive than supports for tier two, for students who are in tier two. And by qualitatively different, I mean that they're more explicit or more aligned, more individualized, et cetera. Great, so most of you agree or strongly agree, and absolutely. What we do with students who are in tier three should be qualitatively different, even more than quantitatively different. So it's not about a smaller group only or more time. We need to do something that is different, not just for more time. Um, before we kind of, kind of get into wrapping this up a little bit here today, I need to take a moment um, to talk briefly about where special education, MTSS, and DBI kind of fit together. Um, because I think there's some disagreement on this and I, I wanna clarify it a little bit and make it clear what I'm kind of saying and not saying. Um, MTSS will not and was never intended to replace special education. Um, despite what I think some people hoped, um, maybe that it would reduce the number of students in special education. Um, but it was never meant to be a system that would make disabilities disappear. Um, disabilities are real. Students have disabilities. And I think if any of you know someone, if you have struggled with a disability, if you love someone with a disability, um, you know how real this is. You know that dyslexia is real. You know that autism is real. You know that attention deficit disorder is real. Um, it's a real struggle that students really are facing. Um, and even if we get it all right, disabilities still exist. Um, the goal of MTSS was not to eliminate special education. It was always that everyone in the district or school would take responsibility for all learners. That a student who had a disability would not be solely the responsibility of the special ed teacher, but that we would all be responsible all together. Um, and special education therefore is integrated into all three tiers. They're in tier one, the students are, and the teachers are we're all integrated in a system working together for all students. So special education is not outside, it's within the system. It's working within the system. It's not disappeared, it's not gone. It's part of a comprehensive system of supports that's supporting all students. Um, and I think that it's important to value what special educators, related, related service personnel um, bring within the MTSS framework in terms of expertise, in terms of their ability to provide clinical um, support to students. Um, that's really important and it's important to draw on some of that expertise when we're talking about DBI, regardless of whether the student in question is a student with a disability or not. Um, either, you know, whether or not we're talking about where special education fits and all of that, it's important to point out that if you're thinking about DBI with students with disabilities, that there is evidence supporting the use of DBI for students with disabilities, quite a bit of it, and that it also fits in with special education law. So this does not counter, you know, it's not like, oh, we can't do this because they have an IEP. No, this is part of an IEP. If, if you've listened to this and you've thought, this sounds familiar to me, it's because some of this is similar to how IEPs were meant to be in their initial infancy. This idea of being more prescriptive, of using data to inform our decisions and making adaptations. Um, I love this quote that I found armed with data and objective problem solving. You can do anything required to move a student forward. You're not bound to wait until next year's IEP. You can make a change and you must make a change, but base your changes on data and documentation. Um, and I think that's what DBI provides for students with special education. But I also wanna be very clear that this is not only for students with disabilities, right? And those data that I showed you at the beginning of this presentation, I showed you data from two districts. Some of the students who, who were below benchmark and who were not making good progress 
um, those students, some of them had disabilities and some of them did not. And some students with disabilities were making good progress or they were on track to meet their benchmark. Um, this, we just need to be inclusive when we think about who needs DBI. We're providing the support to the students who need it, regardless of their disability category and the label that they may or may not have. All right, so based on that brief um, thing, implementing all tiers of an MTSS framework with fidelity will eliminate learning disabilities and the need for special education services for most students. How do you feel? All right, great. So most of you either disagreed or strongly disagreed with that statement that you know, implementing the tiers of an MTS framework will eliminate the need for special education services for most students and learning disabilities. It will not eliminate the need for those services. It will not eliminate the underlying disability. What it will do is help a student get on to reach benchmarks, to reach the grade level expectations. So it will support a student with learning disabilities. It will support a student with special education if implemented well with Fidelity with all three tiers intact, not just tiers one and two, but also tier three supports intact. We can help all students. We can help students with disabilities, including students with more severe and profound disabilities, to be honest. We can help those students, but we will not eliminate special education and, and hopefully in the future, special education would be able to provide even more intensive and, and clinical levels of support that could help us to do this even better. Um, so how does the Michigan MTSS Technical Assist Assistance Center kind of see our role in supporting DBI implementation moving forward? Um, well, we kind of have several things that we are looking at for this year. We recognize this year is pretty crazy <laughs> for most of us. Um, this is a whole new ball game for everyone. Um, so we will continue to provide universal trainings in all different areas of MTSS supports from assessment to interventions, tier one, tier two, et cetera. Um, we'll continue to provide targeted and intensive assistance for tiers one and two, two implementation. Um, but we also want to do um, a DBI model demonstration where we work with some partners to develop the coaching model, the training model, the resources, um, and the collaboration necessary to make DBI successful. I'm in hopes that in the, in the years to come, we'll have developed a, a clear scope and sequence of professional learning to support DBI implementation successfully in our schools with our students. The reason we want to do this, um, <laughs> this demonstration this year is that we realize that implementing DBI is difficult. <laughs> That's a very, very, very big, big understatement. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny um, knowing uh, Doug Fuchs and Lynn Fuchs pretty well and Sharon Vaughn, and they wrote in 2014, despite evidence supporting the use of DBI, many schools and teachers find it very difficult to implement in practice. Um, I think it's funny because I've spoken with them and I know that they would put like five exclamation points <laughs> after that if they could um, because it is really hard. It is extremely difficult. It takes a lot of support, a lot of people um, to make this work. It, it takes a whole team to get up that rapid, to get this figured out, to problem solve. Um, and so it's really challenging and we recognize how challenging that is. Um, and there's plenty of evidence to suggest how, how challenging it is. Um, uh, Doug Fuchs and Lynn Fuchs have done a lot of work um, in Nashville, Tennessee for many years um, implementing DBI um, and implementing MTSS, implementing interventions. And one thing that they've consistently said is that they would have some really great successes. They'd be working really closely with schools. But when they left, when the grant ended, when the funding went away and they weren't able to keep the staff in the building that they had, um, most schools were not able to continue providing this on their own. And it's something that they've talked about over and over again, how difficult it is to continue this work um, when those supports aren't in place. And so our goal is to figure out what can we do to get those supports in place? How can we help schools um, to avoid some of the implementation pitfalls that are really common and like <laughs> all over the DBI literature? Um, some of these things are attempting to implement DBI with too many students. Um, it sounds like a good option. We should be doing it with every struggling student. The problem is we can't. 
to provide this level of intensive support, you really have to narrow it down and, and provide it for only a couple students, one to two um, in, a, in a classroom, right? That's all you can do. Scheduling and logistics can make fidelity very difficult um, in settings. I was a special education teacher for six years and, um, and then I was working in schools for another six providing interventions. And one thing that made my work in both settings very difficult was if you would show up and open oh, an assembly today, oh, this today, oh, can you come back next week? We're doing testing. Oh, we're gonna do this in a couple weeks or, oh, actually she needs to do this other makeup work today. And that would happen, you know, once, twice a week. Well, that makes implementing with Fidelity really difficult and really difficult to know what's going on. Um, and so scheduling and logistics, and those are natural things. Those are things that have to happen, but they're real logistical hurdles that we need to figure out how to help schools navigate and how to help them kind of avoid those pitfalls. Um, also, inadequate supports at tier one and tier two will pretty much doom DBI to failure. Um, so we need to know and understand best what things have to be in place in tiers one and tiers two if tier three is gonna work at all. Um, and so we really wanna come alongside districts to help make tier one and tier two strong um, and to know the point at which schools are ready to begin learning and begin applying the DBI work in their setting. Some other common pitfalls, um, difficulty identifying and obtaining best match intensive intervention platforms. That's very difficult, especially in the secondary grades. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, um, confusion about the data analysis procedures. I don't know that our teacher ed programs have done a particularly excellent job of preparing us as teachers to be really critical of data, to know the rules and the ins and outs of how to look at that data and talk about slopes and trends um, and look at consistent data points and efficacy data, et cetera, and diagnostic data to make decisions. And I think that that's really important when we're doing DBI work. And that's something we need to build our competency around. Um, another common pitfall, failure to make instructional changes. It's one thing to look at a graph and know that a student isn't making progress or to look at your school's data and say, oh, we need to work on this. It's another thing to make a change and then to apply that change. Um, and that's what can really kind of break the system, right? That's where we kind of break down. We know something's wrong, but we don't know how to fix it. And part of that is because I think there are too few really teacher clinicians that are out there working in our schools today who have the sufficient training in either reading or math or writing or behavior intervention and assessment and data analysis who are prepared to be those like frontline intensive intervention coordinators. Um, and I think that that's something that we need to work on developing that, that skill set and that competency so there's a group of people prepared to do that. Not to subvert the excellence and the expertise required to provide good tier one and good tier two. You need a lot for both of those things. This is just another skill set and we need to make sure that there are individuals in each school who have this skill set. And so our goal um, at the TA Center is to learn in this DVI model demonstration how best to prevent these common pitfalls and keep them from occurring for schools and to come alongside you. Um, uh, I would love to talk more with any of you about how you can access um, Michigan MTSS technical assistance for DBI or about the DBI process in general. I'm looking forward to um, over the next few years um, interfacing with some of you, learning about what you're doing about your work, um, and I'm excited to kind of join with some of you um, as we support um, implementation of DBI in our students who have our most intense learning needs in our schools. Um, our Michigan MTSS TA Center catalog is coming out. Um, so be on the lookout for that to find out additional training opportunities. I know this year is gonna be a little different than what maybe any of us expected, um, but ho hoping to offer some really um, exciting training opportunities in the future um, this year. Um, okay, so just to wrap this up, we have a little bit left. I'll kind of briefly summarize what we talked about today and then we have some time for questions. Um, as I mentioned in the first part, some students require intensive intervention despite access to quality tier one core instruction and a validated tier two intervention. If you do everything right, there will still be some students who will need something different. Those students are at risk for a host of adverse academic and life outcomes unless they're provided with significant support. DBI is our kind of best bet research-based process for providing individualized intensive support to these most vulnerable students, including those students who have disabilities. 
the DPI process is centered on individual student data and figuring out what's going to work for that individual student. The process itself has five steps, which we repeat over and over in a systematic way until normalization is achieved. And that word normalization simply means that the data of the individual student reaches the level where we're no longer concerned that they're going to meet the benchmark. Um, DBI is part of tier three supports within an MTSS framework. That's where it functions best. That's how it should be provided. Um, so successful implementation of DBI relies on a strong foundation in tiers one and tier two. Um, Michigan's MTSS Technical Assistance Center is committed to supporting district and school implementation of DBI as part of its support for overall MTSS implementation across the state. Um, and we really look forward to coming alongside you to help those students. And I know personally, I'm really excited to um, work with you as we work with our students who need the most, who have the strongest needs right now in our school system. Um, and I really look forward to speaking with, with many of you. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of references for all the stuff I've talked about um, in this slide. In your handouts, these references are provided. So if you are interested in finding any of these sources or looking for them, um, they are here. Feel free to reach out to me if you would like copies of any of these articles. Um, there's my contact information again, and we have about 15 minutes left. So at this point, um, I'll open it up if there's any questions from anyone um, or anything. Um, that I didn't touch on that you wish I had. Um, we'll give it a couple minutes. All right. Well, um, we've reached the end of our time. Again, um, if you didn't feel comfortable asking a question um, directly, do feel free to reach out to me through email. Um, if you didn't like something I said, feel free again to talk to me through email. I'm happy to talk about it and discuss with you. And I, I look forward to learning from your insights about what you're seeing in your schools and in your districts. Um, if you would please, um, fill out this evaluation. Um, it is extremely helpful. It will help us um, plan. It's pretty quick, painless. So um, if you would, please, that would mean a lot um, to me personally, but just in general, it will help us prepare better programming in the future. So thank you so much for participating. I know um, how much you guys have going on and on your plates right now. So I can't tell you how much um, it means that you were able to participate. So thank you so much.